right now we're at a moment where the, the big tree of our world is falling. So what am I saying is the empire that's falling? Well, I think a lot of it is, is, is about uh, individualism. One of the dominant stories the last 50 years has been the rise of the individual. This magazine cover on the left, this is a very famous one from the 1980s. Most people track the start of the me generation idea to the 1970s, the notion that people uh, were more selfish. You know, now the same thing is said of, of millennials uh, being accused of the same things that boomers were accused of, of being so self-absorbed. And our culture is definitely shifted in that kind of way. And there's, there's all sorts of ways you can see this. Like, for example, there's a, a paper showing how song lyrics, popular song lyrics, have gone from being more we and us oriented 50 years ago to much more I and me oriented today. So our, our, our mindset um, has changed. This mindset has changed us in other ways too. And in particular, uh, a belief in, in money has really risen in society. This is what my book was about. And one of the things I cite in the book is this study done by UCLA of American freshmen, college freshmen, all, all across the country about their beliefs in life. And it asked them about their most, what, what life goals they see as being most important. And there's one about being rich. And in 1970, just 28% of, co of college freshmen said that being rich was essential or very important. That year, the, the most, uh, mo most important life goal was to quote, develop a meaningful philosophy on life. Something like 86% of students saying that was essential. The last year this study came out in 2017, it was 82% of students said that being rich was essential. And if you chart out these answers over the years, you can see that this belief in wealth has been uh, one of the most significant changes as well as the decline in the belief in meaning and the goal for meaning. But like the desire to be an artist has stayed the same, the desire to be good at your job or have a family has stayed the same. But our relationships to, to money and meaning have evolved. And this has also coincided with the cost of living just massively increasing. And this has also coincided with people's pay uh, largely flatlining since the 1970s. And so families have had to make up this difference by having a lot more credit card debt and mortgage debt and people just really living on the edge. And it's that world that is colliding now with a pandemic. Avalanche of evictions, this phrase that came out a couple weeks ago describing what is about to happen. Or even if you look at the Google search trends for $600, which is the amount of extra money in their unemployment check for the past three months, which has been life-saving for a lot of people, and it's about to run out. You could see how important that is and how it's appeared in the public consciousness. And so coronavirus is, is accelerating and, and just making clear the ways that we're falling short. There's a piece I shared in the newsletter earlier this year uh, by this public health expert. And she was talking about how in every medical school, the, the uh, medical schools focused on surgery or personal individual health are like these gleaming temples, the fanciest things you can imagine, but that institutions focus on public health are just like in the dumps, nobody cares. And that, that is emblematic of how in, in, especially America and a lot of the West has thought about the world. And now that coronavirus is, is putting this to the test, we are finding that America is not an advanced society, that an advanced society is one that has learned to look beyond individualism, look beyond just financial growth as their notion of success, and to see the other spaces of, of what those of us on this call would, would say is the bento. Into this accelerating moment, you also have Black Lives Matter, mass uh, social upheaval. You have confrontation of, of huge problems that have been ignored and perpetuated and perpetuated to the advantage of those in power. But even this is being pushed out in this moment. And of course, this is, there's still the climate crisis losing, looming behind this. This is way, way bigger than, than any of this. Extinction Rebellion is a, uh, uh, a civil disobedience group that started in the UK that's trying to create mass arrests to change people's attitudes toward the, towards the climate and create a new form of governance around the climate. And their theory of change is, is based on this very famous idea that a lot of people talk about now. When just 3.4% of a population engages in acts of protest or civil disobedience about an issue, that that is enough to create more than 50% of support in the public. And they showed this with the original civil rights movement, with, with Gandhi's movement in India. And we're seeing that play out in an amazing way right now. Black Lives Matter is the largest protest movement in American history, and people are hugely in support of it. 
If you look at all the charts of like how people feel about race relations, how people feel about police, all this, it is completely flipped, it is accelerated. And this shows the power of just like 3.4% of the people being motivated to take a stand on something. And so all this is evidence of, of the first reason why I think, first piece of evidence that things are really shifting and why, and it's that the values that are dominant in our culture are changing in a really big way right now. Here on the right, I have what I think are sort of the defining rising values, climate, social justice, employee rights, not one we think about, but there's been a lot of work on employee rights, gender equality in the workplace, gender equality everywhere, racial equality, workplace everywhere. I write here nationalism. I don't mean that in terms of like, um, uh, you know, hating immigrants. I mean that in terms of nations wanting to be less dependent on China, wanting to produce things at home. I think there'd be more of a rise of localism for, for different kinds of reasons. And also there's just like a values pluralism. I think people are embracing more and more values. I think of values functioning like a technology stack. There's like a deep database architecture uh, that is then attacked attached to a back-end architecture, which makes it more functional, and finally a front-end architecture, which allows people to interface with it. And I believe that for our values, it's, it's the same. If there's a moral belief layer that then gets expressed as rules, this is what it means to, uh, you know, you must not violate these expectations. And then incentives, ways that we try to get people to follow uh, these new ideals. And these values change all the time. Um, one example that is totally invisible to us is the value of transparency. Uh, transparency in business was, was not a, a conscious value until Enron, until 20 years ago, there was this massive fraud and uh, trust in business plummeted uh, around the world. And so then the business community elevated this new value of transparency as a way of earning back that trust. There was a deficit that had to be earned back. And so the values shifted. And these values are have proven to be meaningful. You can tell because people uh, are more like, CEOs are more likely to lose their jobs by violating them. You see things like uh, rankings for best companies really embrace the value of transparency. It's a thing that uh, the people that judge these things really look at. It's been elevated into the consciousness. And so I believe that all of these values right here are gonna be elevated into the consciousness in the business world specifically that all of these are gonna be things that you're expected to have a position on, to do something about uh, internally and externally. And that this is sort of this value stack breaking down and resetting itself because of this crisis moment. Uh, now, what this also means is that for companies, uh, the responsibilities are hugely increasing and they are basically governments at this point. Now, CEOs know this. Uh, this is a study from the Wall Street Journal last year that was surveying European CEOs, and it shows that 95% of them expect to some extent or to a great extent that their jobs in the future will be about managing non-financial values, moral values, and that they are just expecting that that's coming. This is not activists saying this, this is CEOs saying this. And already we see like Patagonia. Patagonia is kind of like the world government for the environment in a way, or at least trying to be. It's trying to step in where others are falling short. People want them to do this. This is a study by Edelman, a, a PR group. It shows that 74% of uh, the public wants CEOs to take the lead on leading social change rather than waiting for governments to do it. And here in this, in this chart, you can see in this matrix, you can see why that is. It's that no institution is currently seen as being both ethical and competent, right? Business and NGOs here are the closest, but this is what we need. And I think this is the space where probably business and smart governments are going to step forward and we'll take on that responsibility, which honestly is going to kind of suck. You will see probably some leaders uh, abandoning that responsibility and not stepping into it. Or maybe you'll see others try to grapple with this, uh, what it means to be in this position of power. The reason why this is going to be significant and what's going to make this different than uh, other shifts in values in the past is the degree to which metrics are, are so much more prominent in our world. For most of human history, the world operated according to values and values being like this moral philosophical ideal of what's right or wrong or what's just or unjust or what's beautiful, uh, which is like highly specific and very nuanced, but also slow and also subjective, and, and so there's limitations to it. And so then this, this other form of this same idea uh, of sort of talking about the goodness of things emerged, a value, and like a metric value, a number. And this proved to be extremely convenient. 
uh, because you could trade it, you could measure it, you could use it to get other things. Whereas our decisions had been ruled by sort of calling to the gods or to this moral authority of values, over time it became just about what does a number say? What does a metric say? Let's, let's, let's translate this down to a, a value level. Um, and I think this makes rational sense to some degree, but I think that this is something that uh, has left a lot of ideals behind, right? This is sort of, there, there's a lot more specificity, but also a lot that we're missing. Um, and here's a way to illustrate sort of what I'm talking about. To imagine that uh, on this side of the spectrum, you have values, these personal values. And on the far other side of the spectrum, you have these like metric numeric values like money or finance. There's also this space in between that I call rational values, which would be like rules. So if you say, you know, you can't lie, well, you have to set rules. This is that rules layer of the value stack of like what happens if you break them. You have to define what right and wrong is. Um, but the important thing here is that as you move from the left side of this spectrum to the right, the scale uh, of impact increases, right? Our, our personal values are not things that we can impose on a lot of other people, and we should, be, we should be grateful for that. But when personal values can be precisely expressed as rules and laws, then they do actually affect a lot of people. And if you can also express them as like a metric, then actually especially with the internet, they can have a, a global impact. Um, so an interesting example of that, and what I think the new kind of world and economy we're moving into um, is with Adele, uh, the pop star Adele. So uh, Adele, when she goes on tour, back when we could do such things, um, her tickets would immediately sell out. And then if fans wanted to get them, they'd have to buy them on secondary ticketing websites for hundreds or thousands of dollars more. So instead of going along with this, Adele found a startup in the UK that had built an algorithm that would measure how loyal a fan was to her as an artist. And they used this algorithm uh, to distribute the tickets. They analyzed people's social data, Spotify data, et cetera, and used that as a way to give like Adele's top 20 percentile fans in each market uh, the chance to buy tickets early and not putting any restrictions on whether they could resell them, but betting that by mathematically optimizing for fairness and community and loyalty that it would produce a different outcome. And this ended up being extremely successful. A very small percentage of those tickets got resold and it did create this different kind of experience for these shows. And this is not an, an altruistic decision for on Adele's part. Like she's trying to create something she also wants as an artist, but she's ultimately doing this by thinking of the us. And, and she's also She's satisfying a financial requirement of like the show's not losing money, but then she's maximizing for this loyalty metric on top of that. Now there's a, a fantastic book uh, by Douglas Hubbard called How to Measure Anything that's very practical. It just explains like how it is you go about creating metrics. And, and he really stresses that absolutely anything is measurable. The question is, is it worth measuring? Is it, is it economically viable to measure? And I, and I think in the world we are now, it is extremely so. And that the, the need to measure um, and the desire to measure it is going to grow. And that what we are witnessing right now is, this, is where uh, financial value has been our only sort of metric value that we've thought about, that this is about to expand in a massive way. That things like community, sustainability, purpose, Tradition, security, fairness, knowledge, well-being, mastery. Uh, these are all things that will become um, rationally understood, rationally defined, and even defined as metrics. And the same way that, say, we've seen calories emerge as a kind of a secondary language when understanding food, that these types of words and ideals uh, will become that around all kinds of different facets of our world. Now, driving this are a set of new paradigms that are emerging at this moment. Um, one is being led by this woman here on the left, Mariana Mazzucato. She's an Italian-English economist. Um, we'll talk about her more in a moment. Another is uh, the Donut Economics by Kate Raworth. The city of Amsterdam is now going to be operating its economy and its city according to this notion of trying to stay within a safe donut of space rather than trying to endlessly grow. There's also things like um, quadratic, quadratic payments, which is a, a notion of how do you counteract inequal financial inequality and embrace populism with deciding uh, what things should happen. It's an interesting model that's being used in Ethereum. 
It's also a liquid democracy. This is the idea of no longer having representational government. And instead, you pledge your vote on certain issues to experts that you want to speak for your voice. And then just two other ones that are very important at this moment, Andrew Yang and, and UBI. And also this, this notion of modern monetary theory, which is uh, a very new idea that basically we can print as much money as we want if it's used for specific purposes and it will only create good. And so this is something that I think you might see emerge after the crisis. But there's a shift in how people are thinking. But I think the most important voice in all of these is, is Mariana, Mariana Mazzucato. Um, her, her book on the left, The Entrepreneurial State, is amazing. And it lays out the case that all of the technological marvels and pharmaceutical marvels that exist around us, basically all of them were created by government-funded science, largely U.S.-funded science in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s that was very long-term thinking and that was imagining what are, how, what are the building blocks of the next society. And like the creation of computers and computer programming languages, like this was decided way back then, like a, a planned kind of strategy that played out very well. She shows how every element of the, of the iPhone was created using a government grant. Very powerful book, very persuasive. And then she has another book, The Value of Everything, which really makes clear the way that we've allowed financial value to define what we see as valuable. And it's allowed us to, to really create a very narrow view of the world. Now, where she's important right now are these two pieces here on the right. One is a piece that she's, she's now arguing for sovereign wealth funds. The idea that governments should take an ownership, just, a, just like a, an equity ownership in every company above a certain size in their economy, not taking any control over what those things do, but simply part of the wealth of those companies is distributed to all the people in the population. And that by being a member of a nation uh, that is a wealthy nation, that that's how you provide for basic needs. But the even more interesting idea is the one on the bottom right uh, of a new well-being budget. And this is around the idea of of creating a mass jobs guarantee and reimagining what it, what it is to work. And to think of work not as what is producing financial value, but work as what will produce the, all the different forms of value that we need. In effect, arguing for something like this and arguing that instead of using, say, a UBI, a universal basic income, and giving people money and trying to do that to sort of solve inequality, we need to rethink what it means to what jobs are and how it is we create value for one another. We're not running out of work to do, there's more work to do than ever, we just don't properly recognize what is important. If you think about what, what do you call this, like this is you know, sort of just things are changing, but towards what? And Peter Drucker is a very, uh, you know, very mainstream business writer from back in the day. And he wrote this fantastic book in the early 90s called Post-Capitalist Society, where he talks about how by 2020, um, by, by 2020 was his estimate, that we would move away from money and financial capital being the most important thing in the world, that there would kind of be enough. And instead, the most important thing would be knowledge. And what would distinguish the, the people who succeeded the most versus least was their degree of knowledge, which companies were most successful versus not was about knowledge. And he foresaw the greatest social challenge uh, of this century would be how knowledge workers are treated, compared to how service workers are treated. And he just foresaw that there would be a great schism there. It's a very prescient book written in 1990, but he writes about this world, which he calls the post-capitalist society. He says, this will not be an anti-capitalist society. It will not even be a non-capitalist society. The institutions of capitalism will survive, although some such as banks may play quite different roles, but the center of gravity in the post-capitalist society is different from the one that dominated the last 250 years. Yes, providing for your financial needs is important. That's now like table stakes. That's no longer what's exciting or interesting. And in fact, all the challenges that are most important to be solved involve creating new forms of value, a new kind of ecological sustainability, a new kind of social value. Here in the US right now, we see what happens when we don't have social trust. That's a value that we need to refill. And this is happening at this moment. Here's a quote I saw um, in Business Week last week. This is from this guy, Jeff Ubin is like a notorious activist investor. Activist means like tries to make companies sell off all their assets. He says, quote, finance is like done. Everybody's bought everybody else with low cost debt. Everybody's maximized their margin. They bought all their stark stocks back. There's nothing there. And he wrote this announcing he was shutting down his hedge fund because there's nothing left to do. It's, it's, there's just nothing interesting. 
and instead he's starting a new fund around uh, climate investment because he sees that's the only place where there's opportunity. So this notion that, that Drucker talked about is, is happening. Now, when we imagine moving into like this post-capitalist world, you know, we might imagine some orgy of values, you know, some mix of Ken Kesey and Bernie Man, and this is the Seattle Chaz Autonomous Zone, just a really depressing uh, world and, you know, or, or not depressing depending on your personal taste. You know, it, it can be like that because it's, it's new, it's different, it doesn't have the clear anchor uh, that we're used to of, of financial individualism. Um, so what we need in this world to, to make sense of it is we need a map. And of course, that's what the bento is. The bento is, is a map of this world that we're moving into because what's happening, we are being forced to reckon with our future selves. The climate is forcing us to think about not just this moment. Social justice is about reckoning with the us and reckoning with everyone's me and thinking about our, our, the larger implications of what we do. I think that this is a map of the new space in which we're operating as individuals and as companies. And if we take this list of values that are emerging, we can map them to the bento. We can think about these as almost like genres of values, that people working to increase knowledge or increase the sustainability things, those are future us kinds of efforts. And perhaps with time, we can learn that there are shared traits between these things and that these people will actually collaborate. And then maybe, Five people that are working on, in silos in their areas to develop community might discover actually they're all working in this now us space and there's something that they can share and learn together. So I think that this is a map of what's, of what's going on. And if I think about that Mariana Mazzucato idea about new jobs, distributing goods and value according to a new sense of value, I think that we're looking at a future of a very different kind of work than we have today. The future I'm talking about, I'm talking about 10 years from now. You might say it sounds crazy to imagine there's a lot of new jobs in 10 years, but here, here are all new jobs now. Uh, Esports, gamer, you know, of course, in the 1980s or 90s, if you're told you could be paid to play video games, you'd say it's ridiculous. Uh, being a dog walker is a job now. That's a sign of like how much more we value dogs and animals as members of the family. Personal trainer, never a job before. Whatever the hell our jobs are in tech, being on Slack all the time, whatever you call that. And, and, and China now, um, just recently, they have classified blogging as being a job that qualifies you for like the basic uh, economic benefits. And people who, have, who are out of work in China are instructed that if they start blogging every day on WeChat and just writing about their daily life, then they will start to get paid and they will be treated as like an employed member of society. I believe that China is recognizing that as a kind of social value that they are now paying people for partially because of the desperation of coronavirus, but also because our sense of values are changing. What do I imagine being a new kind of job in this world? Yeah, blogger, a citizen journalist, maybe you're a neighborhood greeter, you know, when new people move to your neighborhood, you're the one that shows them around, tells them how things are, make sure they feel included. Like a public peace, nonviolent public peacemaker, like I would love that as a job, I think I would love, it would be great. Petty dispute mediator, um, taking care of older people, providing food for just your neighborhood in a, in a non-financial way, um, being a person who administers various cultural rituals, mentorship, group ownership accountant, like, like let's really think about different models, uh, a value steward, someone whose job it is to look after one of these spaces to make sure these things are being well taken care of, or even thinking not about a doctor, but like a health tracker and health being considered as not just a, uh, your physical health or just your mental health, but all those things say holistically together. So I think that these, these values and, and the bento is a kind of map and that we're going to end up thinking about there being future collective value, current collective value, our language and our, the way we distribute goods and structure governments, that this is going to change to reflect this. Some of the books that really inspired me, there's many more, um, but ones that I, I would all recommend. All these are super interesting and I think are uh, books that anticipate where we are and that are, are giving us an answer for what to do. You know, there, there's just so, so many fascinating echoes of where we are. And, and this, this person right here, this is John Maynard Keynes, and he's one of the you know, two most important economists of the 20th century. And he wrote a very prescient and very legendary letter. And he wrote, when the accumulation of wealth is no longer of high social importance, there will be great changes in the code of morals. We shall be able to rid ourselves of many of the pseudo-moral principles which have hag-ridden us for 200 years. 
we shall be able to afford to dare to assess the money motive at its true value. The love of money as a possession, as distinguished from the love of money as a means to the enjoyments and realities of life, will be recognized for what it is, a somewhat disgusting morbidity. But beware, the time for all this is not yet. For at least another hundred years, we must pretend to ourselves and to everyone that fair is foul and foul is fair. For foul is useful and fair is not. Avarice and usury and precaution must be our gods for a little longer still, for only they can lead us out of the tunnel of economic necessity into daylight. Now, he wrote this in 1930, and he wrote, for at least another hundred years, we must live this way. We are at that hundred year point. We are at that point where this belief in financial individualism and that as what is defining of success and that is what will lead us to some sort of nirvana, that belief is falling. It's falling short in this moment. It, it's, it's showing it's incapable of responding to a collective challenge like coronavirus, which of course is just a preview of the collective ch challenge of climate change. But I still think this is not something to fear. And that on the other side of this, there is abundance. There is a, a plethora of values. There is a, a pluralism and a diversity of life that I think we all know is necessary. And this is a challenging transition, but it is towards something that is, I think, beautiful uh, and, and will truly meet a lot of our needs and meet the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.